May divorce be with you? Eh? Eh? The game is about Jackal and his quest to destroy life as we know it. Are you telling me I'm in this living hell till the end? Everyone in the game is based on someone I know. Oh, that's nice. Oh, so you're saying all we got are bad guys. I can't figure out if I want to warn all humanity or start a religion based on it. Doesn't matter. When I win, it's how I play the game. You know, sometimes, kid, I wonder if you know why you program me. Ow. Fine. We're back on this horse, and after two diversions, we're back on the originally intended viewing order for the series, with Episode 5, Divorce Lawyer, which was pushed to Episode 9 in the actual airing order, which causes continuity problems, blah blah, etc. We're ignoring that. So here's the best bit of trivia you're likely to hear today. The writer of this episode is one Kate Boudelier, and while you may not know that name, most of our audience should be familiar with another example of their work. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to be back at work. Craig, she's dead. Yes, she wrote the Shark Derby episode of Baywatch, one of the best episodes of television in the 90s, if not ever. The one where a main, air quotes, character dies of delayed onset eaten by shark because the actress wanted the hell off the show. If you have no idea what we're talking about, go watch Allison Pregler's Baywatching series. You'll be a better person for it. Okay, okay. She also wrote and produced multiple episodes of Rugrats and the Wild Thornberries, and a bunch of other stuff mostly for kids. But of course we're going to focus on Baywatch. What channel did you think you were watching? Ah, uh, 90s Washington, D.C., when a pasty, philandering warmonger who got impeached was in the White House. How far we've come. The episode starts with the usual, with some red shirt being treated to a touch of jackal before the inevitable kill counter bump. Shark team. Shark derby. It all connects together. Show me! Show me! Let's go! Isn't she something? And on top of that, she grows her own tomatoes. As funny as that is, it's also perfectly needed to talk about who's playing this episode's boss. Actress Victoria Rowell. Because she's legit kind of fascinating. Fans of 90s TV will recognize her from her eight-season run as Dick Van Dyke's co-star on Diagnosis Murder, playing a manly Bentley Livingston, a character who, in the pre-series Diagnosis Murder TV movies, was played by Cynthia Gibb, aka Lauren from this very show. Life is weird. Soap opera fans will recognize her as Drusilla from The Young and the Restless, with a 17-year run on that show, which earned her multiple NAACP Image Awards, several Daytime Emmys, and a couple of years of legal battles. As in, she sued CBS in 2015, alleging racial discrimination and retaliation that kept her from getting hired on other shows after she left, a case eventually settled out of court. In more positive trivia, in 1990 she founded the Raoul Foster Children Positive Plan, an organization dedicated to providing support both financial and emotional to foster kids, which Raoul herself was. She's also a New York Times best-selling author. Neat! So on the one hand, it's kind of fitting the role she plays here as a tough fighter. On the other, well, we'll get to that. One opening credits later. We're off to find out Lauren has an interview with the president, and... My dad is turning 50 next week, and I'm throwing in this big old party. The whole family is coming, except my stubborn brother. Gus and your father still aren't talking? They weren't talking when I met him, and that must have been... Like five years. This dialogue is actually kind of natural. We learn through normal conversation that this character is Gus's sister. Well done, exposition. Also interesting that Lauren and Gus's sister are still friendly. My dad is turning 50 next week. Gus's dad is only 50? Must have had Gus young. This scene may seem like filler, but it's important. Later. Boy, am I saying that a lot this time around. Speaking of important scenes, but for different reasons, Gus and Peter are searching for their lost game files, which got scrambled way back in episode one. Uh, let's not get crazy here. I mean, we lost like 40 other programs in the action. It could be any one of them. We'll compare gigabytes. How many gigs are we talking about here? 
2,912. I'm sorry, could, could you repeat that? 2,912. Sweet McGillicuddy, that's nearly three terabytes of game! The machine I edit this series on now has two terabytes of space total. As of this writing, World of Warcraft is only 72 gigs, and that's with the addition of the entire Warcraft Classic game. And that's not even taking into account that this is happening in the early 90s, where the average home computer hard drive was just hitting 2 gigs. The game would need over 4,000 installation CDs. Suddenly, the advanced AI and the hyper-realistic graphics make a lot more sense. Let's not get crazy here. I mean, we lost like 40 other programs in the accident. It could be any one of them. They lost 40 other programs? How big were those? Peter, how many other programs do we have with at least 1,000 gigs? I don't know, seven, eight? We had three. Who at your university did you do unmentionable things with in order to get that kind of memory cache? We found the game. <laughs> Gus, work with me here. If I can recover the game... I can just erase the bad guys. If they don't exist in the game, they can't exist in real life. That sounds overly simplistic, but I'm well aware of what show I'm watching, so yeah, I'm completely ready to go along with that conceit. But... Hear me out here. Maybe just delete the whole game. Yeah, it's a lot of work lost. Nearly three terabytes of work lost. Three terabytes? How do you even... But, you know, people are dying. Lauren and Gus have a phone convo, which leads to news of the electrocution, and Gus's jackal sense starts a tingling. He figures out who they're dealing with on the quick fast, and Lauren bolts on her five-minute interview with the president despite the fact she'd be waiting longer than that for a cab. There's the usual got the first clue wrong shenanigans, and then... You broke it, you bought it, lady. Honest Abe's rules. Fun fact, Honest Abe here was also in an episode of Diagnosis Murder later that year. Back at the dead end... Oh my god. Wow, nice 180 snow scope, Lauren. We're now at a hotel where Gus has joined Lauren for the obligatory villain briefing. Honest Abe's Pawn Shop. How much closer can you get to honesty and integrity? Shot? I thought Fox TV and repair made sense. I'm sorry, okay? Definitely a different time. As at this point, the name Fox will never be associated with honesty and integrity for the duration of humanity's existence. So about 50 years. Michael J. Fox, all right? He married his girlfriend from Family Ties, who was played by Courtney Cox. I thought that was the connection. Except Michael J. Fox married the girlfriend played by Tracy Pollan. Sure, she got the trivia wrong, which led to the wrong decision, but let's give her credit. Lauren absolutely has the main thrust of Gus's insane moon logic down at this point. She hooks a generator up to that power cable she stole, and then she connects the cable to each of the judges' chairs, making them... Electric chairs. And the gavel strikes at 9 a.m. sharp. Them. If she's electric, why does she need the generator? Well, she's only got 10,000 volts. That's a little shy to zap nine people. <laughs> oh. That chuckle is a thing of neighborhood watch lists. <laughs> Lauren is taking the fact that the villain is based on her divorce lawyer. Well, isn't the right word for it. It barely seems to register with her. Yeah, she'd probably be a little distracted since she just had to blow off the president. Oh, oh, Clinton. Oh, let me rephrase that. Uh, she just had to run out on the president and put her employment at risk. But you think she'd be giving Gus a lot more shit about the game because of his gross mischaracterization of a woman who does a job that is absolutely vital. Knowing what we know about Gus, her precaution on hiring a divorce lawyer is thunderously warranted. Given how bitter Gus is at Courtney... Wait, Courtney? Oh wow, I just got that joke. A woman who, near as I can tell, did nothing to him. Now, she's programmed to get the gun at a place whose name infers honesty and integrity. Two things Courtney Lake knew nothing about. I mean, we've got no evidence that Lauren bled Gus dry in the divorce or anything. I don't even think he pays alimony. So you know he'd bring it up. Did I mention this level was slightly different? No. How is it different? The girl calls the shots. Uh, meaning, you're in control. How would that work in the game, exactly? Were players supposed to take control of the girl at this point, or was it a Big Boss slash Solid Snake deal? We cut to Peter finding the bad guy files so you don't forget that he exists. Also, the villains are doc files? The same format we save our scripts in? 
Oh man, I'd hate to see what would happen if one of those got personified. Then back to Lauren and Gus to find out that Courtney can only be killed by a copy of Billy Joel's The Stranger on vinyl. Because of course Gus would choose vinyl. You don't remember making love to only the good die young on our wedding night? You can't see my face right now, but I assure you it is twisted up in equal parts confusion and revulsion. What the hell is wrong with Gus? Everyone knows that the rock music you consummate your marriage to is Meatloaf's Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Frickin' mammals, I swear. Did you even remember our wedding night? Yeah. Sorta. Uh, did, you, did you program one of those shortcuts in this level? You know, uh, we win by stopping Courtney from getting the generator. It falls under the prevent possession rule. It's the beauty of the game. Is it though? Guess who I had dinner with a couple nights ago? Sophie. She mentioned this big bash she's having for your father's 50th. She flew to Washington to get you to talk me into seeing my father? I'm not going to be glib and mock Gus's issues with his dad here. Whatever went down with his dad is clearly bad enough that he gets triggered just by the mention of him. And I'm not using the word triggered here in a mocking sense. I can't read James Calvert's delivery here as anything but a post-traumatic response. So, point to James as an actor. Greetings to my friends of the shed. Coast. One heck of a fine looking fork. Wait, are we about to edit in? He tried to get no. Of course they get out. It's not terribly interesting and mostly a time filler. Let's move on. Courtney's got the power cable and the generator. So all that's left now is to wire up the judge's seats. Shouldn't we be heading her off? Well, let's come up with a plan first. Besides, she's not programmed to be there until after Law & Order ends. This was way back in the olden days, when Law & Order was sometimes not on TV. What did your father do that was so terrible? You know how a father's supposed to love and support you and push you to be the best person you can be? Yeah. Well, my father pushed me to be the person he wanted me to be. And oh yeah, he left out the love and support part. This is why this episode is important in the overall show, despite the boss-related plot being mostly superfluous. I used to see cards and letters he'd send. You just returned them. You think he was writing to apologize? He was writing to criticize. Gus was clearly a bright kid who was driven constantly by an impossible-to-please, emotionally unavailable parent. And Gus is, in turn, demanding, contemptuous of failure to live up to his standards, self-loathing, obsessed with being seen as clever or smart, and ultra-sensitive to criticism. Only he wound up accidentally creating supervillains instead of landing in the presidency. Are we laying it on a little bit thick? Dude, have you, like, seen the last three years? Fair point. Well made. Is this the file you wish to delete? Yes. That's some prime Christopher Lloyd face acting. Delicious. Of course, since there's still a good 20 minutes left in the episode, it's time to pile on the plot complications. Put your hands on top of your head. Listen, Gus, um, we got a problem. Uh, I don't know why yet, but uh, racing Courtney? Froze up the computer. I'm locked out. Can't do a thing. A power down will lose the file location and force a research and somehow undelete Courtney's file. But leaving the system locked up leaves Jackal open to sending more and more villains. This is, of course, not how computers work, but why start worrying about that now? Bring her back. With Courtney out of the picture, Jackal's got him a mess of extras who are put on stage in the clothes they walked in wearing, and a dog. Somehow, a doggo has wronged Gus in such a way as to earn a role in his revenge game. I desperately need to know his story. The Wolfman scratched my car and he must pay! I gotta say, I do like how nobody's moving or blinking, as if they're paused. It's a nice video gamey touch. Is that Kato Kalen? How bright is Kato? We're still not in the big house. <laughs> you want me to kick his ass for you, Kato? Yeah, man. Until the next time! What happened? Back in Gus land, he's being super awkward with Lauren's lawyer, as it turns out Jackal went out of his way to get Lauren arrested, but not Gus. And predictably... Craig, she's dead. 
Sorry, had to. Courtroom shenanigans ensue as Boss Courtney tries to sabotage Lauren's defense. Here's the highlight. Dang, she's good. Another snap headshot. Bet she's a monster in Fortnite. Keeping things short, things look dire, but it turns out Courtney only knows what Gus knows about the law, which is all from TV shows, which is diddly. Which is pretty clever writing, honestly, as it's completely fitting for Gus to not actually do any research into what he's going on about. And no, I'm not joking, I legit like this plot point. Huh, he's not dead. On the one hand, I'm shocked, but on the other, it makes sense. Killing a judge really wouldn't accomplish anything. After all, they've done the most important part of this whole subplot, kept the heroes occupied and out of their hair. So yeah, Courtney doesn't know how to file any legal paperwork, so she doesn't, and thus Lauren is set to be released in the morning. Good news for Lauren, bad news for the Supreme Court. This is the second lingering shot of Courtney stepping through a man's ashes in her high heels. I'm getting DeviantArt Wonder Bread flashbacks here. And then suddenly... Jackal! And I don't like threats. I never lie. And I hardly ever use threats, since I usually have no way of backing them up. <laughs> okay, that was a good one. Gus gets stuck in the elevator, and because this is a pre-9-11 world, Lauren's attempt to warn the guard that there's going to be an attempt on the Justice's lives is brushed off. It's the morning of the attempt, and after absolutely no one questions why Gus was in the Supreme Court elevator after hours, he meets with Lauren in a last-minute attempt to stop the Supreme Court from becoming... an electrical circuit? Eh? Eh? Hey! Completely ignoring what this episode said earlier about them having to research the whole game from scratch if they power down and restore Courtney, if that was what they were saying, the whole computer thing in this episode was utter gibberish, Peter sets to work and inadvertently confirms the nice suspicions that the villains in this game were made with a simple plug-and-play approach. None. Strike three. You're out of here. that the defense's sole strategy in this case is to create a smokescreen of theoretical... So I wonder, uh, what happened to Jackal? He always shows up for the last word. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. Man, I would pay a lot of money for a Christopher Lloyd-Alice Cooper duet. So... This episode is really middling, which sucks because there's plenty of good building blocks in here. The most important plot point has nothing to do with the guest villain, and thoroughly squanders the idea that Lauren is in charge of beating the level. That the villain is based on Lauren's divorce lawyer is almost inconsequential to the story, despite some very extensive screen time. She's cool and confident, and I'm not gonna lie, that's very appealing on a lot of levels, but despite having shark teeth powers, it all swings back to shark derby. She doesn't get to chew on any scenery, and that's really what I'm here for, over-the-top bad guys. I don't need her to be wacky, just more intense. Bloodthirsty would be a good direction. The idea of a boss based on a mostly amicable ex's divorce lawyer is a tremendous foundation for a character-driven episode where Gus learns stuff and maybe grows as a person. So in my hypothetical reboot of the series, I'd absolutely keep Courtney. But I'll go into more detail on that at a later date. And while I do really like in concept that it's Peter who saves the day without Gus's moon logic, something I'd normally applaud, it's half-hearted applause, since it comes at the expense of Lauren claiming victory in an episode that's supposed to be about her in charge of beating the level, which is mostly just Gus backseat driving, which is the kind of thing that would get you booted from a fair few Twitch chats. Up next, it's revelations aplenty when our heroes get ready for the unexpectedly early end of Jackal.
did you like that bit of nonsense? Well then why don't you click like, and subscribe, and press that bell, or whatever YouTube wants you to do. You can also do us a big solid by joining our Patreon, where you'll get to join us for live streams, get early access to the newest videos, and other such things. Geek Vision. Diagnosis murdery. Why can't I say diagnosis? Diagnosis. Oh boy.